It's working? All right, cool. Yeah, so I am, I'm the other Bruce. Um, I've been studying data science myself. I, I did a lot of machine learning before, and I've been studying like the more applied side of data science recently. And I actually participated a little bit in this competition, which is why I wanted to give a presentation on it. I didn't get that far, but. Did you win? No, I, uh, I managed, you know, I had an issue early on where I was randomizing my, the order of things, so then I was getting about 50%. But I sorted that out, and that's about as far as, far as I got, so. <laughs> Is there going to be offensive language in this presentation? What? Is there going to be both? There will be offensive language in this presentation. So, <laughs> so cover your eyes, basically, um, when we go over the data. Yeah. <coughs> and the original plan for this presentation was to use OneNote, where you can fold and unfold stuff, which is kind of like my slides, um, and to be able to write on the, on the OneNote as well, to create some graphs and whatnot. Uh, that's not working, so we're just going to go over a PDF of the material, and uh, I'll gesture with the mouse. That's how it's going to be. You can pull up paint or something. <clears throat> yeah, if, if it's important, then maybe we'll, we'll figure that out. All right, so here's a, a snapshot of the, the top ten contestants in the public leaderboard. Um, actually, I'm not sure if this is the public leaderboard. It might be the private one. Um, so you can see the scores are all, they're pretty close. The, uh, the difference between being in the money, which is the top three, or just getting gold, which is everybody else here, um, you know, it's, it's pretty close, right? So you're just trying to get those last few points. Um, the scoring is by the area under curve. We'll go over that in more detail. Can you please zoom in to the PDF a little? Can you please zoom in? So uh, sorry, what? Can you please zoom into zoom the PDF in. a little? Yeah. This is a lot better, thank you. That's about as much as we can do. <clears throat> so the, the competition, so the, the context is there's lots of online forums, right? And they can be very helpful, but sometimes people say nasty things on those forums and then people <clears throat> leave those forums. And so it'd be helpful to be able to automatically detect these nasty comments so that you can handle them somehow, and there's various ways to, to handle them. Um, so this competition is based on the comments by people who are building Wikipedia, basically, and your task is to detect and to detect toxic comments, and also to detect what type of co toxic comment it is. So here. Um, so here's a, a sample of the training data. So every item has an ID, and then there's the comment text, uh, the highlighted ones. Don't look at those if you don't like offensive language. And then you can see, I mean, all of those are labeled as toxic. Uh, the first one is labeled as severe toxic, right? Obscene and an insult as well. Um, so yeah, so you're trying to, so basically there's six, six binary labels for each example. Uh, yes, Matt? Hello? Oh, perfect. Uh, so if something is severely toxic, does that automatically mean that it's toxic as well? I don't know. OK. Yeah. yeah. So the test data. Obviously, they don't give you the labels for the test data. Otherwise, it's pretty similar. You need to provide probabilities for the labels and submit that. Yeah. Hello. Oh, yeah. So, um, if so, are there um, comments in here that are not any level of toxic? That are just normal, yeah, inoffensive, yeah. and they're all zero then for the labels. Yeah, you and then if you have to predict a probability, a, a would a you? A lot of these are all zero, so yeah, you need to. So then you would have six, seven classes, right? Because so for I mean, if everything's zero, right, and you need a probability at the end, uh, um, I mean, because the labels are all toxic, so like everything's bad, right? If you just look at this column then there's two labels, right? Zero and one, right? 
So think of that as one you know, machine learning problem. And then you can look at this column, and those are all zeros and ones. So there's two labels there. That's like a separate, think of that as like a separate problem. Does that make sense? So it's, so, okay. So it's like six related but separate predictions that you're making, yeah. All right, so you need to take the test data and you need to provide the probabilities and you put those in a, in a CSV file like this, um, which it looks a bit clearer if we look at it in Excel format here. Um, so you got the ID, and then you have a probability of whether it's toxic. So this one, we think it's probably toxic since we gave it a probability of 99.5%, right? Um, this one's probably not toxic since it has a probability of about 0.1% of being toxic. Um, so you do machine learning, you figure out these probabilities, and then you submit a CSV, CSV file like this to Kaggle, and they score it for you. Um, and for the scoring, there's a public leaderboard. So you can submit your file and you kind of see how you do. You make sure that you didn't mess up the ordering like I did with the public leaderboard. But that's not what your final score is based on. Uh, the, your final score is based on a, the private leaderboard, which is you know, a, a separate group of data, which nobody gets to see before the very end of the competition. Um, and that's to prevent people from doing, I guess, leaderboard probing, where they, they make lots of submissions and they get to figure out what works best on the leaderboard, right? Um. Hello. Isn't there still some subjectivity involved in deciding with, whether something is going to be labeled as toxic or not, <clears throat> even when we get to that endpoint? Yeah, I, I think that's totally, totally subjective, yeah. Um, and I think a lot of us humans would agree on, the, on these labels. To, and I'm sure there's some mislabeling as well, right? I don't know how they created these labels. Um, maybe it's part of the Wikipedia process, or maybe they did Mechanical Turk, but there's probably some mislabeling as well, some label noise. Yeah. Um, all right. No. So uh, what was the threshold that you have uh, chosen in order to predict whether it's a toxic or non-toxic? Um, there is no one threshold. We're going to go over the area under curve metric. Um, you just submit the probability, and then we're going to go over that criteria next. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right, so the evaluation criteria is the mean, columnize, ROC, AUC. So ROC stands for receiver operator curve. AUC is just area under curve. So it's the area under this receiver operator curve. Um, but remember, we're doing basically six different predictions. So we're going to take the average over all six of those predictions as well. So let's first understand what this receiver operator curve is. So here's an example receiver operator curve. Here, I don't know if you can read this. This is the true positive. On the y-axis, we have true positive rate. On the x-axis, we have false positive rate. And um, generally, there's a trade-off between the two. So let's say that you want to get about 40% true positive rate. If we look over here, then we're around here. So that means we're going to get about 20% false positives in order to get 40% true positives, right? Uh, I heard something about a negative. False. Nope. False positive rate and true positive rate. So, so in one extreme, you can just predict that everything is positive, right? Predict everything's toxic. And then you end up right at the top right here, right? Because you predicted, you've got 100% of the false ones, you predicted as being true, being positive. 100% of the true ones, you also predicted as being true. So that's why you end up here. 
At the other extreme, you can predict, okay, none of them are toxic, and that's, so you get zero, zero, zero true positives and zero false positives, so you're at the bottom left here. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll go over this in more detail. Um, okay, so here's some data that I made up, some simple data, and we're gonna make this receiver operator curve, um, or we're gonna talk about how it was made since we can't do that live anymore. Um, so what we, what we do is we take our data, we have these probabilities that our model calculated, and then we say, okay, what if our, our threshold is zero? So if our probability was above zero, we say it was toxic, okay? So if our threshold is zero, then we're gonna predict that all of them are toxic. So they're all true, which means we have 100% false positives. These false ones, we're predicting they're true, and we've got 100% true positives, right? These true ones we're predicting are true. And so that gives us a point right here in the top right. Can you see it? Yeah, you're up here. <laughs> um, so if you change your threshold to 7%, now this one doesn't have an, a high enough, prob a high enough uh, probability, so we predict that it's false now. So now our false positives, so we've got three false, we only predicted two of them to be true, so our false positive rate goes down to 66%, which is around here, and we still have a 100% true positive rate. So that gives us this point, and then we increase the threshold again, and now our false positive rate goes down to 33%. True positive is still 100%, so we get this point. Um, we raise it again. Now we lose one of our true positives. It becomes false at this threshold. And so our true positive rate becomes 50% now. Our false positive is still 60, is still 33%. So we get this point, and then this point, and then this point. And so we get this whole curve, right? Um, which is very jagged because we only have five data points. Um, but that hopefully gives you an idea of how this curve would actually be calculated. And then once you have this curve, you can calculate the area under it, which would be 5 6 or about 83.3% in this example here. Are there any questions about this? So this would be one of the receiver operator curves. This is how we could calculate the area under that, and then we could take the average over the six different predictions we make of the area under a curve. Um, how are we doing? So, so one strategy is we can just submit the best probabilities that we can, and then given that we've got the best possible probabilities, um, by this method we get the best possible area under curve, um, or we could take into account that actually the, the, the probabilities themselves aren't what's really important here. It's actually the relative probabilities, right? So if we could have, if this was 0.2 and this was 0.15, then our curve would have gone straight up and straight over, right? So what lost us area under curve points here was that um, that this the probability of this true po of this actual toxic comment was lower than this probability for one that was false? Um, so you could try to more directly optimize the area under curve as well. Um, so what would the receiver operator curve look like if you had a perfect classifier? Yeah. In a perfect classifier, you could get 100% true positives with zero false positives, so you'd get a point right up here, and you could fill in the rest, you'd get a graph like that. If you made, and so then you'd get an area under curve of one, so that's the best you can do. What would you get if you made up random probabilities? Yeah, you'd get, it'd be a little bit jagged because of the randomness, but it would look basically like that. And then your area under curve would be about 50%. So that's what I was actually getting when I had ran, when I had shuffled my predictions before I submitted them accidentally. So if you get about 50%, you've probably got a randomness error. 
All right, so that's the, that's the evaluation metric for this competition. Um, next, I'm going to go over a bit of the neural network architectures that were used. Um, are there any questions on the evaluation metric first? Yeah? So for the, com for the competition, <clears throat> were you uh, penalized just as much for misclassifying something versus missing a classification? Obviously, optimizing the receiver operating curve, you're deciding which one's more important. Um, so ultimately, you weren't classifying anything, right? You were just giving probabilities oh, I see. for, you know, what's the probability this is toxic, you know, 0.6. What's the probability it's extreme toxic, 0.2. Um, so you're just giving probabilities. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can you pass the mic back to Matt? Hello, great. Uh, I'm just wondering what the base rates were for the different types of oh. uh, toxicity. Like, was it like 20% were toxic, that kind of thing? Yeah. I actually don't know. Okay. That would be valuable, um, valuable work to do early on to understand the data. But uh, I'm, I'm, I mainly went over the winning submissions and they didn't cover that, so. All right, so. Um, the main neural network architecture that was used in these competitions was uh, recurrent neural networks, and more specifically, grooves, or even more specifically, bi-directional grooves. Uh, so we'll go over what a recurrent neural network is. A recurrent neural network, it has a loop like this. Um, and so we could take this and we could unroll it. So this is just an unrolled version of that. And then we can see here you've got maybe the first word of your sentence, which is going into your RNN, and then there's an output. But also, this uh, has, a, what is it, a hidden state that it outputs to the next um, loop through the RNN. And so here you've got the second word coming in. You also have the hidden state from the first, um, I don't know, the first pass through the RNN and you output, you create a new output, and so on. You add in a new word, pass the hidden state forward again, and get a new output. Um, so that's an RNN. RNNs are very flexible. They work great with sequences, which text is a sequence, right? Um, so that's ultimately what RNNs are built for. <laughs> you can unroll this. You can make it as long or as short as you want. You could, in theory, you could handle uh, variable length text, um, although generally I think it's not that convenient to do so. So, so that's a basic RNN. Now, should we use our RNN going forward through the sentence or going back, starting at the last word and going back through the sentence? Well, often it's best to do both. So we have one that goes forward and one that starts at the end of the sentence and goes back through the sentence, and then we'll say that, well, this output and this output, they kind of correspond to each other, right? So if this is a vector with 80, um, I guess, a vector of size 80, and this is a vector of size 80, we would say, okay, we're going to put those two together, and we're going to make one vector of uh, size 160, okay? Um, and similarly, the last one here would go with the, the first one in the reverse RNN. Um, so you concatenate those. So that's a bi-directional RNN. Um, now, we haven't talked yet about what we have inside this A here, right? What's the structure inside here? Um, it turns out that something like a GRU worked very well for this competition. A GRU stands for a gated recurrent unit. And here's the internal structure. I won't go over this in, in total detail, but I'll talk a little bit about, uh, about some of the stuff that's happening here. Uh, so this here is a sigmoid. So this makes, so R here is gonna be a number between zero and one. So it's taking the hidden state, it's taking the new word, and running it through a sigmoid, getting some number between zero and one for each component of your vector. 
And then here, this is a gate where we multiply that number, that number that's between 0 and 1 by the hidden state. And so you can think of that if, if r is 0, we're not letting any of it through, right? Whatever it is, when you multiply it by 0, it doesn't get through. If r is close to 1 for a certain, um, a certain component of the vector, then we're letting all of that through, right? So this is a gate that chooses how much of our hidden state we're going to let through here. And then we combine that with our word somehow, and we send it through a 10H and whatnot. Uh, we also have here another sigmoid and a Z, and then that goes here, and so this is another gate, which will choose, you know, how much of this are we going to let through here and ultimately add to our output. Um, and we're going to take 1 minus this Z, and we're going to put that for another gate here. Yeah. Sorry, quick question. Is a GRU what would be inside of an LSTM? No, a GRU and an LSTM are two different architectures that both achieve similar results. Yeah. A uh, GRU might be slightly better when overfitting is a significant uh, concern. So is the overfitting a significant concern in this case where an LE, an L, uh, sorry, an LSTM in this competition? Work? Yeah. Uh, I guess it was. If empirically, empirically people were using GRU, the, sorry, the winners were using GRU more often than LSTM. So sometimes they would use both and ensemble them and whatnot, but yeah. Hello? Hello. Yeah. I have a comment. Yeah. Um, it's, the GRU can be seen as a special case of an LSTM. Okay. Yeah, so you can simplify it. And then the, uh, the native RNN reduces as a special case of the GRU and the LSTM. So it's LSTM, yeah. yeah. So just cool. wanted to say that they're all related. So kind of LSTM has more power, yeah. which might cause it to overfit more. Exactly. Yeah. The uh, GRU has less power, yeah. but like less, flexi less flexibility, so less yeah. power, but it will overfit maybe yeah. a bit less. Yeah. And the regular vanilla RNN is even less power. And probably not enough power. The only um, thing that a group buys you over a, a regular RNN is its ability to remember uh, previous time steps. So an RNN will decay because of something called the vanishing gradient problem. So in the case of text, you would have with with a vanilla RNN, you're looking at only a memory of about eight words or maybe six words or something. Hmm. With a GRU and an LSTM, you can have a memory of about 30 words. Hmm. Um, so, yeah. Um, okay. ju just because the, the GRU and the LSTM takes care of something called the vanishing gradient problem. Va vanishing gradient problem? Pro okay. Yeah. I, I didn't know they only had a memory of about 30 words. Yeah. So even they are limited, like LSTMs. Yeah. Uh, though they're, s they're supposed to take care of the vanishing gradient problem, they only mitigate it to a certain point. Okay. Yeah. It's good to know. Um, and what I find kind of cool about this with the 1 minus z and the z here going into these two, two gates, mm -hmm. this is a weighted average, really. Your, your, new, um, your new hidden state is a weighted average of the original one and this thing we're feeding in here. So, um, and in this, for this RNN, the, the output and the hidden state going forward are both the same for the GRU. All right. Um, and so lastly, um, so here we talked about one layer of bidirectional RNNs. Um, so lastly, so usually they were using GRU, a GRU for their RNN, gated recurrent unit, or specifically they're using bidirectional gated recurrent units. And usually they seem to be using two layers. So you have one gated, one layer of gated recurrent units, and that output from here becomes the input to another layer. And that, that's what seemed to work well for this competition. Um, 
And we already discussed the, the point of a gated recurrent unit is to allow stuff to last for longer, um, to, to carry state forward for longer. All right, so next I'll discuss the, the first place uh, team's approach. The first place team has a fantastic write-up. We'll probably post this PDF somewhere after. Um, or you can just find this. They have a, they have a fantastic write-up write where they, they break down, as you'll see here, they break down what made how much difference in improving their score. Uh, their basic model was they used pre-trained word embeddings, like fast text and glove. Um, and they also use these word embeddings trained on different corpuses of text. Um, yep. Can you just talk about what a word embedding is? <laughs> All right. Um, in relation to the... Uh, yes, right. Um, so maybe there's 40,000 words, 40,000 possible words, right? So somehow we need to represent each word as a bunch of numbers to feed into our neural network, feed into the rest of our neural network. And the way we do that with his, is with an embedding. So each word gets mapped to a vector of maybe 300, um, 300 components. And that vector somehow captures the, captures something about that word. So in, what? Oh, the meaning of the word? Uh, yeah, I have the opinion that it's the word's meaning, and uh, there are other people who argue that with me, but I'm pretty sure that's the meaning. <laughs> so in some embeddings, you can see that king minus queen, so you take those two, the difference between those two vectors is approximately the same as man minus woman, right? Um, so... so it's King minus man plus woman equals queen, yeah. So if you take, that's what you're doing with the vectors corresponding to those, those words. Um, yeah, so, so this, this just works as a way to feed these word, words into neural network. You embed them into 100, 200, 300 dimensional space, and then you feed it into the rest of your neural network. Uh, yeah. Um, cause yeah, just a comment, I think, cause I guess the alternative would be something like bag of words where you end up with an incredibly sparse matrix as your input space. And so this gives you a, a very dense, um, structure to play with, which is a lot, mm -hmm. plays a lot better with it. I also had a, a comment as well before. Um, so I know that it, word embeddings plus uh, one dimensional convolutional net, neural networks are pretty popular. Was, was anyone using that kind of approach here or? Was it all grew and there were some convolutional neural networks, yeah. and there's this uh, pyramid convolutional neural network that it seems might have done fairly well. Oh. Um, Is but that for generally, like a wider field? generally so. the CNNs or convolutional neural networks weren't doing as well as uh, the RNN approaches. Interesting. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Was there another question? No. All right. Um, yeah, so they start with a word embedding for their words that was pre-trained. You know, Facebook or somebody else figured out what word embeddings worked well, and they just used those. Then they had two layers of bidirectional gated recurrent units. And then they had two kind of regular dense layers on top of that. And then they made their predictions based on that. Um, right. And so some of the, the factors that they identified as very important was first using diverse pre-trained embeddings. Um, so they, they used a bunch of different ones and then they averaged or somehow ensembled the, the probabilities to get the best, best of all of them. Um, so they, even with that, they did quite well. 
And they, make, they made this remark, which is quite insightful. So about over 90% of the model's complexity resides in the embedding layer. Because there's, if you've got 40,000 words, and for each of those words, you have to choose, you know, in your 300-dimensional vector, what will each of those 300 numbers be for that word, that's 40,000 times 300. That's a lot of kind of numbers that you're choosing. Um, so most, most of the complexity is there, yeah? Uh, just a question. So these, these vectors, uh, what values? Are these like binary vectors or real vectors? Or um, So they're going to be floats. <laughs> Um, I assume they'll be generally within a certain range. I'm, I'm not sure about the details. Maybe somebody else can speak to that more. Usually between zero and one. All right. Yep. Okay, so sorry. Is this a, is this a form of principal component analysis, like just reduction in space? To no, no. Okay. Principal, um, yeah. I guess I don't think we could do principal component analysis. Um, the embeddings are generally trained on on a made up task, like you could. I think the typical one is you take I guess twelve words on either side. And then the middle word is either the word that was supposed to be there or you replaced it with a, a random word. And then you train a neural network on, you, then you embed the words and you train a neural network on that and you try and predict whether you, the middle word was the original one or one that you randomly inserted in, in, in there. Um, and so you've kind of, you've made up a task which requires some understanding of how words flow together and then you, you train a neural network to figure out the embeddings that allow it to do that task. And those embeddings happen to be useful for lots of other tasks as well. So um, like how someone would use a PCA like is similar to this, right? So people will use dimensional reduction for a couple of things. One of them is to make it so that the computation is tractable, so they can actually do it, and it doesn't like happen in a thousand years, right? So you want to dimension reduce. Another part is try when you try to look at the data to actually see what's going on. And you can't always do that, but there's different dimension reduction techniques to do that. So PCA is one of them. Um, all these models have both implicit and or explicit assumptions, and they can give you different results. Like, like you're looking for latent structure in the data, right? Like what's in the data? I'm not imposing anything on top of it. Uh, so PCA um, is something you might use in another situation where you would use this. And for text data, there's these word embeddings. So embeddings basically there's thing that like you're reducing the dimensions, right? And um, for text data, like one of the ones that I mentioned, like word two vec, um, the geometry of it seems to learn some of the meaning behind the words, but not all dimensional reduction stuff with text does that though. I think that's an example just like when you look at it. Yeah. I have a question about uh, what they did there. Uh, so they took like different um, pre-trained word embeddings and they combined them. Like what did because for me it's like you cannot take one word embedding you know, like created by Google and you know, one by Facebook and then try to so put them together. They would train one one model on fast text, for example. And they used, they always use the biggest ones possible. So the 300 uh, length vectors, fast text vectors, they would train one model on that. And then they train another model on glove, for example. And then they would ensemble them. Does that make sense? So they're training different models. Each of those models makes its, its predictions. And then they average the predictions or they do some. But those yeah. models would be like the same um, architecture, right? So yes. those two, so, okay. Yeah, what they found is the, the architecture doesn't matter that much. The embeddings you use in the first place, those matter a lot. 
because that's where most of the complexity resides. Would it make sense? To, uh, like, is it fair to say that if you take all available um, uh, word embeddings out there and train on them, that would make model to be to work better? Um, or, or you ha uh, have to choose like you have to choose like okay, we'll take this one and this one and it will work better than taking like five of them. I, I would assume that having more embeddings would be helpful. Um, but then you need to know how much of each one do you want to include when you, when you average the predictions. So if you have lots of different word embeddings, you train a different model on each of those word embeddings, somehow you need to average their predictions into a single prediction, right? And some of the word embeddings might be better than others. So. Okay, so based that on that, uh, uh, is it fair to say that it was, um, again, a competition uh, mostly on uh, uh, a number of GPUs people were running? Because those are sequ sequential models, and it takes time to, to train the sequential model. Um, it's not uh, parallel, right? I would, I would say GPUs, like you need a GPU, but even though, like first place had six GPUs available to them, second place just used one. So it, uh, you need at least one GPU and you need a certain amount of time to run through and try different things. So did they say how, how long they would train it on, um, on CPU? CPU? So the, the top team, they were using 10-fold cross-validation, which having lots of GPUs might help with that. Um, and they said it would take about two hours for each of their training cycles. Um, the second or, no, I think the third place team had one fellow who had spent six hours to train his model on a single GPU. Yeah. What did the output layer look like? So was it just six logistic units doing zero, one, whether toxic, non-toxic? I, I assume it's six logistic yeah. units. They didn't even talk about that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So they, they, I, I added in this. I added the output layer in here. Okay. <laughs> they, they didn't even mention it. <laughs> so, so okay. So logically, assuming that it's six sigmoids at the output, did they talk about what kind of cost functions they used? Like, was it the mean squared error or? Did they? Did they? Op you said they didn't optimize the A, uh, the AUC directly, right? The, uh, Sorry, they didn't optimize which? The area under the curve as a metric directly, as a cost function. So, um, I don't know. Okay. Yeah, okay. I yeah, I assume it would be, what is it? I assume it would be the standard one for binary predictions. Okay. You know, the log. Cross entropy. What's it called? Cross entropy, yeah. Yeah, okay. Or, or the, yeah. Yeah, the binary version of it. Okay. Um, another comment about the SVD uh, or the PCA comment um, is that uh, back in the day, Glove, it actually is inspired by uh, a PCA or an SVD on the co-occurrence of all possible words. Oh, okay. um, so <clears throat> that, that's actually a pretty good question. You should look at the Glove paper. Cool. Oh. Uh, another question back there? Not a question, actually a comment. I think the output layer should be like a vector rather than in the individual. They want to have some kind of um, relationships too. They are capturing it between those labels. So they will have it as one vector, most likely. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. okay. That's it. Okay, I don't know. Um. All right, so in total, I think they used six different embeddings, which they then averaged or ensembled somehow. Um, so they trained six different models on six different embeddings. Um, yeah. Embeddings were trained on different uh, corpuses of text. Um, so there is this idea in the, this competition of using, uh, using Google Translate as a kind of data augmentation. So what you do is you take your English sentence, you translate it to French, then you translate it back to English, 
and you'd have a slightly different sentence. And then you'd, uh, so this is like new data that you've manufactured, which is similar to the original data. And by, so it gives you more data, right? Like any data augmentation. Um, and so this gives a significant boost here. Um, and so they used three, I don't know, three pivot languages. Um, and so they... It, and that was legal? I thought with Kaggle you weren't supposed to use anything outside. So the, the rules depend on the competition. For this competition, people are obviously using pre-trained word vectors. Um, so presumably this was allowed. Maybe it was posted in a forum. Maybe this is because they had to, so that if you're using external data, you have to post it in the forum so everybody kind of knows about it. Uh, how does this make sense? Um, <laughs> that this works. So if you have more data, that's, so having more data is one of the best things you can do to improve your results, right? So if we could get 10 times as much data from Wikipedia, we would get much better results here, right? Oh, so they, didn't they, they didn't replace it, yeah. Um, so this isn't as good as actually getting more data, but we've manufactured data, which is actually helpful because when it's translated back, you know, these words are a bit further or closer to part, or they used a synonym of this word, and uh, that's, that helps your model train, yeah. So what we're doing here, ultimately, is we're taking some of the, the learning that's inside of Google Translate, we're putting that into our augmented data, and ultimately into our model. Um, Right, and so they also would do this at test time. So at test time, you, you make a prediction on the original sentence, you also make a prediction on the translations of the sentence, and then you average all of those predictions. And so this is called test time augmentation, and it, gets you, it gives you slightly better probabilities as well. So they also use pseudo-labeling, which pseudo-labeling is you don't actually have labels for the test data, right? So what you do is you label the test data, and then you train on those labels. And this actually seems to give a consistent boost in performance. Um, so when you're labeling the test data in order to train on it, you want, you want to get it right as much as, as much as possible so you aren't training on your errors. So they took their best ensemble so far, labeled the test data, and then trained on that. Um, and so one of the things that pseudo-labeling helps with is that your, uh, your test data may have a somewhat distri different distribution than your trained data, and so you, you mitigate that problem somewhat by labeling the test data, which you'll, you'll label it most, mostly correctly, and then you train on now a distribution that's closer to the test data that you'll ultimately predict on. Do they label the test data just with their probabilities, like the direct output of their best ensemble, or do they do a thresholding there? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, there's another question. So if I understand right, the idea is create an ensemble, um, use that to label the test data, then do subsequent training again with the same architecture. Does that not introduce um, some sort of downward bias in error estimates or something like that? What, what benefit would there be to creating labels um, and then from the, with the same architecture uh, training using those labels as truth? Mm -hmm. Hello. Okay. Yeah, you're totally right. Uh, but the thing that happens, or that you hope that happens, so this isn't always a magic thing that always works, but if, uh, essentially, if the model learns the distribution faster than the bias gets introduced, then it actually is a net positive. 
So if you have a really poor classifier to start with and you do the pseudo la uh, labeling, it'll actually probably make things worse. But if you already have like a well-tuned one, there's a possibility of actually getting an, an, a little extra boost. Um, so mathematically, I mean, would the, would the, would the labels even change? I guess, I guess it depends on the, on the, uh, model. I guess, yeah, some objective functions, there wouldn't be a difference, but yeah, cro um, with cross entropy, yeah, the, you could make the probabilities higher then. I'm thinking of more of a regression thing where, okay. All right. Makes sense. Thank um, you. So I, I have a question for Matthew. Um, so in order to learn the distribution, you would need to make hard predictions rather than, like, you'd have to train on hard predictions. You wouldn't, couldn't just train on the probabilities. Is that yes. right? Yeah. yeah. So what would happen here is you would just take, like, argmax, or not argmax, you'd take the, um, the clip or something like that. Uh, either one or zero based off of whether or not it's higher or less than 0.5. Uh, if you're doing this in scikit-learn, so you're doing a classic uh, thing, there's actually a package inside of scikit-learn called uh, semi-supervised, and there's two algorithms, one called label spreading and one called label propagation, uh, and it has a pretty good explanation of what's going on here. Uh, there's some talk about manifolds that like, I don't really understand, but manifolds are involved. <laughs> <laughs> so... Some, something else, another factor, maybe that uh, your ensemble is performing well, maybe because one or two models can make a good prediction, and some other models might be more unsure. Um, so the models can actually learn from each other. Um, and also, when you have dropout, which they usually will, if you have dropout in your neural network, um, your, your, during training, you can learn to use the other features uh, because maybe the, the, the key feature that allow you, you, allowed you to do the pseudo-label, that feature, when that drops out during training, you're learning to use the other features now to make the same prediction. So, yeah. Cool. Um, All right. So they did pseudo labeling, and um, so they did ensembling, basically. So I guess th this is fairly important. This is it's a standard thing to do ensembling. Um, what a lot of people do is they just they create a bunch of models and they just average all of them, right? And to get a slightly better prediction, um, they also use light GBM to uh, choose how to combine their models. And ultimately, they found that a mix of arithmetic averaging and light GBM gave them the best possible results, you know, a tiny bit better than uh, just averaging. Um, yeah, so some other takeaways. So their architecture changes made very little difference, so they, they stopped focusing on that. Um, and yeah, and the CNNs didn't work very well in terms of what they tried. So their best CNN scored 0 0.0015 lower than their best RNN. That's right. <laughs> yeah. How is light GBM used for um, averaging? I don't quite get it. Uh, I, I have no experience with light GBM, but I mean, you have features that you're inputting, and yeah. Hey. So I, I just recently discovered this, which I think is great. Um, so because like like JBM has, I think, scikit-learn uh, bindings to it, there's a package called ML Extend, which is written by Sebastian Rauska, you know. Um, so essentially what you do is you just take the outputs of all the different neural networks, and then you train on 
you train a light GBM model on the outputs of the previous with this little stacking modifier onto it. Uh, yeah, that's that's how it works. It's really simple, actually. It's a good question. I think it's before the final thing because those sigmoids just remove all the information, but I'm not sure. That's what I would guess. Yeah. I've seen some code on GitHub. Some people do it uh, at the final levels too. So it depends. So it could be any of those. Um, you're um, mentioning a convolutional neural network there, at, but the problem doesn't involve images. These are sequences, linear sequences. So is this just one dimensional convolutions? Okay. Cool. So I also created a comparison of uh, the top three. So the top score, they just used simple architecture we already talked about. Second place, they used by directional grooves, I assume, and they used deep pyramid convolutional neural networks, which have these ResNet-type skip things in them, and I'm not sure about the details. And I think this might be gradient-boosted gradient machines. Um, so they averaged a variety of different approaches. Um, and third place did even more different things. Um, Drew LSTM, CNN, they used logistic regression and TFID effectorization, they used XGBoost. But the core of their solution really involved a model that used both LSTMs and Drew's. Um, and that single model was getting 0.9878 from a single model. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and so I thought I'd compare the approach that they used. Um, so yeah, so some of the new approaches that were used in some of the other, uh, in the second and third place are, um, second place did, you know, let's translate to French, translate back to English and then we'll train on that, that's our data augmentation. But they're like, hey, we could also translate to French and then use French word embeddings and train a model on that French. And this will just be more models that we can average to improve our ensemble. So they, they took this even further. Uh, they didn't do pseudo-labeling. Um, yeah. And what the third place did is they did extensive feature engineering, um, they, which feature engineering is a way that you can put your human knowledge, right? Inject some of that into the neural network. Um, so they did some stuff with spelling and spelling mistakes and also all caps words. Um, I think more of the toxic comments involved caps. So, and so for that, so this is basically the one model that got them most of the way there. Uh, that team member did these two things. And so when you use pre-trained word embeddings, which are you know, from some general corpus, they're going to miss some of the words that happen to appear in discussions about a Wikipedia page, right? And so typically you just map that to some, I don't know, base, base embedding, which everything that's missing will get mapped to the missing word embedding. Um, but I don't know that's not taking full advantage of the power of embeddings. And so what this guy did is he trained his own embeddings for these out of vocabulary words. He, he found for the words that he already had pre-trained embeddings for, his own embeddings weren't as good. But where he didn't have a pre-trained word embedding, it helped to use his own embedding. Yeah? 
So how did he identify the out of vocabulary words? Did he have some heuristics for that or what? Um, I assume you just, you know, I mean, you tokenize, find all the words, and then your embedding will, it will be a mapping from ultimately from words to their embeddings. And so you can see if there's, if you can't find in your dictionary or whatever the structure is, if you can't find that word, it's out of, out of vocabulary for that pre-trained embedding. Did you see anyone use character embeddings or was it just words? I didn't see anything character-based. I assume that would be a lot more work and, uh, and you'd have troubles taking advantage of all you know, like the pre-trained embeddings and everything that, uh, all the work that's been done elsewhere. Yeah. In terms of absolute numbers, how many labels did each solution miss? Like, uh, I'm, can you uh, put the... In terms of absolute numbers, how many labels did the first place solution miss? How many did they miss? Yes. Um, so, yeah, I guess I really don't know. So the fact, the fact that their area under curve was not one means that they had some of the probabilities flipped from the way they should have been in an optimal solution, right? And so I guess you could quantify that. But uh, so it wouldn't be how many you know, predictions were wrong in an area under a curve. Um, for an area under curve metric, but you could say, you know, how many, how many flips would I need to do in order to get down from 100% to that, um, to that score? And I don't know. Yeah. All right. So that's. That's this comparison, and then lastly, I just have some general takeaways. Are there any more questions? Five minutes? Okay, I think we're good. Oh, it says about 10 minutes, yeah. All right, so the general take takeaways. Uh, first of all, if you can add additional information, this can be very helpful. And so the most important way to do that seems to be to use pre-trained embeddings or adding information other people have figured out. Um, you can train your own embeddings on out-of-vocabulary words. Um, now, you don't, you don't actually train those embeddings further along with your model because then you'll quickly overfit. You, you fix those pre-trained embeddings and then just train everything else on top of that in this competition. Um, so adding human knowledge so adding this feature engineering seemed to work very well. Um, and for text, using Google Translate, we can effectively uh, um, augment our data, therefore adding a bit more extra information. And finally, when we're ensembling, um, if we can ensemble different where we've added information, if we've added different bits of external information, then we can get better scores. So um, the top scoring uh, entries, they all used multiple different uh, embeddings that were somehow combined. Yeah, usually ensembled. And that's, that's my presentation. <laughs>